So, dear, good morning, dear participants of this course. It's 9 o'clock, or past 9 o'clock. And I would like to start with this session, which is on imaging in radiotherapy and patient data acquisition. Let's start with the first picture, which I think is quite nice. It shows an idealistic picture of treatment. And what I would like to say, it's by far not reality. Because of what? <laughs> you see the beam. <laughs> and I think this is something which I was told some years ago, and I think this is a very nice uh, understanding of the situation. The problem is we do not see the tumor or the target. We do not see the beam. But we want to match exactly the beam onto the target. So this is something, this is a challenge. And of course, to get information on the tumor or the target, the clinical target volume, you need pictures, imaging. And this is now the topic of this course. I have used, again, uh, material from this book. And I have also used uh, some material from a book which is uh, issued from in our institute. It is 3D conformal radiation therapy. And it is a, a, a disk-based uh, book. So you can get the information out from, from a disk. So this is what I want to, 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 to deal with. The need for and the types of patient data, data segmentation, segmentation methods, image registration, display of registered image sequences, image fusion. I also want to touch some words on patient treatment position immobilization devices. It is not directly uh, imaging, but it's, it has to do with the problem, to, to match the beam to the tumor or otherwise to match the target to the beam. I will spend words on conventional treatment simulation, computer tomography-based simulation, conventional simulator versus CT simulator, and also want to say some words on magnetic resonance imaging for treatment planning, but not so much. OK, let's start with the discussion on the need for patient data. Within a treatment simulation and calculation process, the patient anatomy and tumor targets have to be represented by a model. Again, we don't have the patient itself. We, if we prepare, if we do the calculation, if we do, do treatment planning, we need a model for the patient. And nowadays, such a model is normally a three-dimensional model. But I may ask, because here are many people coming from countries where two-dimensional treatment planning is still done. As far as I know, having seen the situation in, in, in Indonesia, in one hospital, it's quite a mixture. It's, it's sometimes it, it's a transition from two-dimensional to three-dimensional treatment planning, which a situation which is not easy. So this is an example taken out of the book. This is an example of a, a 3D model. We have here the clinical target volume in violet. It's quite within the two. This is a lung, a lung situation. Then we have the both lungs here as the organ at risk. And we also have the spinal cord here. And this is the outer contour of the patient. So such things are quite nice to see and can be nicely used for treatment planning. But I want to go now on some more general considerations on patient data. Patient dimensions are always required for treatment in order to get the monitor units or 
um, especially to get the monitor units. And the amount of required data depends on the treatment planning method which is used, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, uh, the dose calculation method. Um, may I ask you, how many of you are using now modern treatment planning systems? I think uh, it is a majority now. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So it is not so easy anymore to understand what's done in this calculation and this, uh, those calculation methods. I will go in the next lecture. I will I will touch some of these ideas uh, because in any case. The calculation of those is always an approximation. There is some, some advantages, disadvantages, and I think it is useful to know a little bit about what may go wrong or what, what are the difficulties if one is doing um, treatment planning. In my eyes, and I think you agree with that, there's a really a risk now we can do so many things on a computer. It's like, like, like playing a game. We can rotate the patients, we can rotate, we can do everything. We see pictures, but it's not by far the reality. May, may I just, it has nothing to do with that, but I think it's a quite nice thing. Um, I, I got, I had some pain in, in, in my, my back, and, and I got an MR image of, 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 of the spinal cord. And what is, seen the very strange thing that there was uh, this, uh, how you call it, the, 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 yeah. the, the inner part of the, of the spinal cord. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it shows some, some uh, structure like it was split in a way. Very strange. I never know that. <laughs> I have no, the, the thing is, if I see the picture, I could be, oh, what's going wrong with me? <laughs> But I feel nothing, I know nothing, and, and for me it's now very obvious. Picture is one thing, and the reality and truth is the other thing. I think this is a very general uh, consideration of, of imaging. Nevertheless, uh, here I was discussing the amount of required patient data, and uh, we need as patient data, not directly for treatment planning, but for the treatment positioning, also other data, um, such as landmarks, anatomical or artificial landmarks, or other items. Nowadays, uh, it's quite a modern style to take into account the breathing of the patient and to do a tracking or, or, or other things, or gating. Uh. Is someone doing this here? No. Uh, the gating of, of, bre of breathing, no. No, you do it, huh? Again, it's, it's, uh, it, it may work. It may work, but uh, the problem with that, let me just uh, tell you some things about that, is that it takes some time from the signal to, to the response of the, of, of the accelerator that. And this time may be typical say, 0.2 seconds or something like that. It, it, it is fast, but uh, in that time, the moving goes on. The problem is it, it should be prospective. It should say what is, in, in a few seconds, uh, in a few tenths of seconds, what is the position, which works well for healthy people. But it is always a risk for people who have a regular lung disease. It may go wrong. They <laughs> something like thing may happen, and, and then suddenly it's very different. So, to all these techniques who are trying to, to follow the, the breathing circle are working very well with healthy patients, but may have problems. So we still have to introduce or develop techniques who are very, very fast to really respond immediately to everything what's happening. So patient information required for treatment planning varies from rudimentary to very complex data acquisition. So one can use just uh, distance read on the skin 
one can use manual determination of contours, acquisition of CT information over a large volume. You can introduce image fusion, which is also used core registration, using various imaging modalities such as CT, MR, and PET. And also other advanced methods of ITRT and uh, my friend Pavel Kokolovich will tell you a little more on, on the use of IJT technique, which has a, uh, an increasing role in this treatment of cancer. I personally, I think, I personally think that the progress in radiotherapy. One should, one should say before, we had continuously a, a very good progress in radiotherapy. If, if one asks my, my, my neighbors or my family, and the reputation of radiotherapy is normally not so good. It, it's, it's seen as a palliative method very often. But we know if we have the figures that, that radiotherapy is really successful in many things, in, in many situations. So it becomes more and more successful. But in order to have a more success, more progress, I think the cue will be the better imaging. And I think IGRT, and even this, uh, what is now coming on the market in combination with uh, imaging on directly within the accelerator system, this is a cone beam CT, what we have, but even now the MR systems are developed directly together with the, with the accelerator. I think, I, I certainly, I believe this will be a major step forward, but, but then you, for the first time, you can really see much more better uh, the target, the tumor, because due to the soft tissue contrast, which is offered by MR systems. So this is a typical old-fashioned way of getting contours, which is, I think, not done anymore. Yes, I think in the last 10, 20 years, the development in any country has dramatically uh, changed the situation. But maybe if you look in the, in the textbook of the agency, such pictures are still to be seen there. So now it's, 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 it's over. This is still done. Uh, imaging using uh, using a simulator, using a kilo voltage imaging. This can be taken for comparison with port films during treatment. But I think uh, Pavel Kuglovic yesterday made this point, which is quite interesting. Use of a simulator was quite distributed everywhere in a time where it was too expensive to have a special CT for, for simulation of a, of a radiotherapy program. And it has, as he told us, the, the, the small advantage that you have to position your patient a second time. And there may be some error introduced, and it's nice to see. I've never heard this argument, but I think it's a very good argument. If you use the same data which you use for treatment planning and for simulation, it is, there is no difference between of course, there's again a difference if you really then position the patient, but only one, one uh, influence of mistake. Radiographs are particularly important for irregular field. This is an example where um, this is a prostate. I think it's a prostate, yeah. Uh, which should be irradiated with a block field so you can directly uh, draw the the field site and the blocks onto such a radiograph and um, then help to construct these uh, blocking systems. Again, I would like to ask, blo blocked field is, is maybe also old fashioned now. Who, who is who's still doing blocked field? Yeah. yeah. Oh, not so old fashioned. Yeah, it's still done. Yeah. So you don't have a multi leaf collimator. Okay, yeah. Hmm? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's still good. 
There may be even a risk sometimes. I have seen the risk with, with the multi-leaf collimator because it cannot exactly fit it. So the block fit is, can be shaped much more accurate to what you want to have. And especially if you have some uh, multi-leaf slices with, with, we say, 0.5 centimeter or even one centimeter, uh, and, and you have problems in the lower end and the higher end, and, and I have seen that people are doing mistakes with that. They, they, they think it's, it's quite nice, but it's, it was too much blocked. So I think it needs a lot of practical training to, to really understand how to work with the multi-leaf collimator. You can buy all this equipment now if you, if you are buying new equipment uh, from, from Varian or or Electa, there's the only two remaining companies. They will offer you, of course, a system with multi-leaf collimator. Everything is fine. They will offer you the treatment planning system. Everything is fine. And I've seen, I've seen, really seen that people who are not so well trained do not really understand the problems involved. And, and that has all to do with the margins. Uh, one has to be cautious with the margins using a multi-leaf collimator. So suitable slice spacing is, of course, then the problem. If you construct a, a model of the patient, you may have different slice spacing. Uh, this is a recommendation to use 0.5 to 1 centimeter for thorax, 0.5 for the pelvis, and 0.3 for head and neck. The point is now that structures relevant for radiation treatment can now be identified on the CT slices. The following image processing procedures applied to anatomical structures are typical CT-based procedures. The one is, which is called segmentation. You, go, you can say that it's only drawing the contours, but the name, the scientific name is segmentation. The other name is the process of matching images obtained from different imaging devices, which is called the reg the registration, or if it's uh, even all the use co-registration. Segmentation process in particular refers to the well-known ICU vol volumes that have been defined as principal volumes for treatment planning. This is, of course, uh, tumor gross volume, the clinical target volume, the planning target volume. The gross tumor volume is important because for the purpose of diagnosis and stage staging, the GTV is the most important indicator for measuring tumor remission and therefore for measuring therapy success. Again, it suddenly comes to me uh, when I was visiting this hospital. It's so important to have an information of the success that requires patient follow-up. And I know that I can really easily imagine that that is something which is, again, not easy to difficult and not, not easy to organize. If it's a huge country and people are coming from one corner of the country for treatment planning, then they get the treatment and then they go back far away and they never will come back. So how a treatment follow-up can be done with that and how the information on success or failure can be get. This is something which I think is, is very, very important for, for the self-education for oncologists. And I have seen that in the hospital that uh, it has not been organized because it's, 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 it's so difficult to do. But I think it, it is one of the key things to, to really to, to, to get across with this point. Uh, you, you, you must see what is, have we done something wrong or not. The GTV presents that volume which has to be irradiated. The clinical target volume and the planning target volume, uh, of course, are also important to, to, for segmentation. There is one thing which may not so clear, and even in my home institute in Heidelberg, it's not so clear. Of course, these two volumes, the gross tumor volume and the clinical target volume are poor anatomical volumes which has nothing to do with the technique. It's, it's a patient, it's a disease, nothing else. So it has to be done by the doctors who knows 
the disease, who knows the spread. So they know the, the gross volume and they have an idea of what, what may be involved. Very often the doctors came up and they, I will give you the planning, planning target volume. <laughs> and they, are, and they, they tell you this is a planning target volume and, and, and not the clinical target volume. Uh, we have debates on that, and we, I know there are courses in, in Europe, in Astro, to, to, to carefully educate people, the doctors especially, they should focus on the clinical target volume, and they should leave the discussion on what is the, the planning target volume to the people who are know, who knows very well the advantage, disadvantage of the accelerator. Another point is, there, you, can, you can make a ratio of, of, uh, of, a, of the volume, the clinical target, or planning target volume, clinical target volume, and, and by, by getting this number, you can, you can get the information how well the planning is done over several patients. So if, if the doctors are giving you the, the, the planning target volume, you are missing this, this, this uh, information. This is one example of segmentation with an... Uh, brain tumor, this is a, and here it's already the planning target volume. I'm not sure whether this is the planning target volume. I, 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 I would assume that the doctors have given here the clinical target volume. This is uh, the organs of use, the brain stem, the head contour, the eyes, the optic nerves, the chiasm, and so on. So a typical result of, of, of contouring of segmentation. Uh, and this, again, is uh, what can be done with such segmentation if you use uh, uh, the series of, of, uh, of slices to get a 3D model of the patient. All segmentation algorithms can be divided into groups. Uh, one is region-based approaches. Region-based approaches try to find an area of pixels with similar properties, similar gray values similar Hounsfield units, and the border between the volume of interest and background is thus defined by a cutoff value. This cutoff value may be determined by an algorithm or may be introduced by the user itself. And again, I want to show this picture in more detail where we have here, and I now I, I, I call this this clinical target volume. And what you can see is that obviously such an automatic process will not run at all. Because here, to see this as a clinical target volume, this requires a knowledge of the, of the, of the doctor, nothing else. We, as medical physicists, we can never do that. And we should not do that. <laughs> uh, however, and, and I think this, this is I've taken from the from, from journal, I, I, I forgot the name before I found. This is a situation if different people are drawing the clinical target volume. Here are two cases, the brain. This is a result of eight radiation oncologists, two radio diagnostics, and two neurosurgeons. So they get quite different, different shapes of the clinical target volume. And you can tell, you can use this as saying, oh, not well educated, but this is not true. It, it is extremely difficult to, to find out or, or to know what is the clinical target volume. And again, it needs a lot of experience to, to identify the clinical target volume. There are another method for segmentation measure. This is the edge detection algorithm. Yesterday, uh, Pablo Kogloj was saying that our eyes is especially sensitive for, for seeing edges. And I want to <laughs> tell him already, it, it, it is the nervous cell, the cell, cell itself, which, which behind our retina, this cell always has synapses or, or going to other nerves. They are reducing the signal or they're increasing the signal. And if you have a homogeneous uh, picture, these are canceled out, so the two neighboring cells or the neighboring nervous cells are, are reduced, and at the same time, it's coming back 
uh, it is increased, so they are balancing out. If you have an edge, then there is really an increase of signal in our cells, uh, which uh, with the nervous cells, which goes in the brain. So this happens already just in the cells here. This is edge detection, which is you can you can quite a quite a huge story on that. What we really what we really see is is is, is calculated. So it, it's one thing. What what we see is a calculation in our brain. We we don't see the truth. We have calculated in a way, and and what is quite difficult to understand. Each individual does this, obviously does the same calculation. Which uh, <laughs> each computer is working with the same system, which is very strange. Uh, this is this, an, an example for segmentation uh, for the edge detection algorithm. This original picture, this is the uh, edge uh, uh, method. And by defining a cutoff value of high of the head of the parameter change, the number of edges found has been increased or decreased. So advantage and disadvantage of segmentation method, so of course, manual segmentation, the speed is very low, but it's easy to do. Semi-automatic segmentation may be good in every aspect, and fully automatic segmentation seems to be very good in the speed and reproducibility, but it's, of course, it's, it's not everywhere available, and from my point of view, one should be cautious with this automatic process. Always it needs a control of the well-educated radio-oncologist or medical physicist. Now I come to image registration. Modern three-dimensional treatment planning is based on tomographic images of different modalities. So we have X-ray computer tomography. We have MR images, display soft tissue with considerably better contrast, with which allow a more precise differentiation of tissue. And we also have now introduced more and more the positron emission tomography. Again, I would like to ask, uh, is, it, is it introduced? It, it is expensive. It's expensive. The PET, no, the, the PET scanner. It can be used together. So the CT PET is, is one, one device where you directly can compare, and I will show one picture of that. Um, how many institutions have introduced that already? Yeah. You have access, yeah. My question is, are you using the information of the PET for treatment planning? For fusion. For fusion, yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you, do you put the decision on what to do really on, on the information on the PET? Sometimes, yeah. So what, with the PET you can do much more things. You can function imaging, you can see the, uh, see, because this, this is a, is biological based imaging. It, it's not, it's not the imaging of structures. Hmm? That can be used, yeah. But again, the point is, what you really see with a pet. You see things nice. like, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you see nice pictures. And you can see that this is more uh, brighter. Nice. Yeah, and you can contour that. But what does it mean? And again, I refer to my, to my backbone, <laughs> where I see something which I don't know what it is. And uh, obviously, it has nothing to do with my healthy status. Um, you can see a lot of things with, with, with PET, like, like uh, perfusion, blood supply, or you can, yeah, a lot of things. And um, we, I know from s uh, some projects to introduce this knowledge more and more, really, as a decisive, uh, as a, for the decision of what to do with, with it and where, where is the target volume. But still, I think it needs, it needs even more animal studies for that. We, what we should have, we should have a comparison of the picture of the images with the real anatomical or, or functional uh, process. And uh, this is a, a story which is still needs a lot of development and research. Again, I, I personally think I, I expect a lot of, of, of progress in, 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 the, in the treatment of tumors by, by having more 
fundamental understanding what does the image say to me, a pet image. So to be able to use several image modalities simultaneously, it is, nece it is necessary to establish a quantitative relation between the pictures, the elements of different images. So the mathematical methods are able to calculate and establish these relations. And these are called registration. And this is one example, though we have here a uh, theoretical example, of course. We have here a box which should be go into this. It's two images, and we have to do a lot of tra a translation, a rotation, another rotation, again a rotation. Then we can match these two images together. So it's a typical mathematical process to do that. This is another example, though, we have here. One, uh, uh, this is a, a surface picture, and this is, uh, get, is got from, from a, a surface uh, sensitive uh, imaging, and they should be matched, and it shows how well this can be matched. This is the result of such a matching. Imaging registration can be considered as it's a ticket to the calculation only of the transformation necessary to superimpose information from one image to another one. But you also want to see how, how well it is. So we need a, a, a method to display the result of our registration. And this is normally called the fusion process. So we have here two pictures. And uh, these are now, after the, the, the fusion process, we can see uh, the difference between uh, an MR image and a, and a CT image. Now I will leave this and I will come to treatment position and immobilization devices. So a patient may require an external immobilization device for the treatment depending upon patient treatment position or the precision required for beam delivery. And this is one example on radio surgery, which of course needs a very careful positioning. And I've taken this picture because this is, picture is uh, made in 1984 in our institute. It shows our radio surgery approach, which we have introduced in 1984. And it was one of the first radio surgery treatments using an accelerator. Uh, and uh, from that time, radio surgery was found to be quite successful. And in many institutions, I think also in Trieste now, radio surgery is a small part, but it's a part of the radiotherapy program. In that time, we were, there was only one existing unit that was the gamma unit, which is very precise. And when we started using an accelerator, we are, have been always told you cannot do that. An accelerator is not, cannot done at all. Nowadays, it is, it is, it's, we know that it's, it is not so difficult. And what I also think, which is that I, I am attaching that, if you introduce a radio, a radio surgery program, it is a very good occasion to, to organize a very good cooperation between the different disciplines, between the radio oncologist, neurosurgeon, uh, medical physicist, and technician. Because you only can do if you really work together. And therefore, it, it is a good thing to, to have a good organization of the team, of the radiotherapy team. Therefore, I made sometimes a suggestion that the introduction of radio surgery is something which may help to, to improve the relation between the medical physicist and the doctor. I, don't, I do not know your experience, but I, I have my own experience, and I know from many, many hospitals that medical physics was at the beginning something very low level. And the, meaning and importance of, of doing good medical physics was, has not this reputation which it should have. In my eyes, it should be on the same level of eyes between the medical physicist and the radio oncologist. Uh, this is not always the case, and it takes time to develop it. And uh, just to say that, it has nothing to do with imaging. That's never. Um, I found it 
especially now in our institute, it was extremely good occasion to grow together in such a way that, that, that we are really colleagues. So email, to immobilize the patient during treatment uh, to provide reliable, uh, has two fundamental roles, to immobilize the patient to provide reliable means of reproducing the patient position from treatment planning and simulation to treatment and from other treatment to another. So these are some, some systems here which are from our institute, has been developed in our institute, and it's also from our institute we have such mask system which uh, can be applied to the, to the head, but they are also applied to the total body. On the other hand, this is, is, is very time consuming, and I think it can not be uh, recommended to do it every year, but we had some very precise uh, uh, irradiation, uh, say, in, in spinal cord or even for prostate, where it was quite useful to introduce such uh, uh, system. This is quite normal system which can be, it's the simplest way that you can use some headrest which can be used as, an, as another mass system which is uh, commercially available. And this shows again this, uh, yeah, let me just say that, okay, this shows this uh, radio surgery uh, immobilization device where we had a ring which is really fixed on the table and it has sharp needles which goes into the brain and people normally say, oh God, this is something. <laughs> but uh, it's only a single treatment irradiation and it can be well tolerated with, with local anesthesia and it's extremely accurate. Here? This one. This is something, uh, it's commercially available. Uh, it's, it may be used for, for if you've broken your arm. And then, then you can use, instead of, of uh, in Germany we say Gips, so it, the old technique is, huh? <laughs> it's Gips, yeah. And then you can, you can buy that things which is expensive, but they are, they are flexible and they, they will, uh, by, by warming about, I think, yeah. Expensive, but well doable. And we had implemented such a system with everything, and it works, it works very well. It was extremely accurate. But again, it's, it, it needs a uh, person for that, that it's, it can be recommended for, for in general. It was a special technique which we have implemented in Heidelberg, in our institute, when we started with radio surgery, and, we've, and then we found that fractionated radiotherapy, that not only in one fraction, but in several fractions, is a very good way also for, for, for tumors. So radio surgery is not so well suited for tumors. It's good for anterior, anterior, uh, anterior venous malformation or for brain metastasis. So it's, it's wonderful if you treat a metastasis say a, a liver metastasis, it will disappear in, 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 two, in two weeks. It's very strange. And if it's not coming again, you can really, you can really cure a patient at least for several years. So now I come to the, I have Yahoo, to the convention treatment simulation, simulation process which has been introduced to have a better planning tool for the uh, subsequent irradiation. This is an example for a very simple technique. It's called the double exposure technique. A film is irradiated with the treatment field first, that is here, and then it is the collimator are open with a wider setting and a second exposure is given to the film. So you can see some structures in the film and you can see how well the irradiated film matches with the structures. It needs, again, experience to use with that. But it, it's a very simple technique. Uh, but I've, I've seen that, and, and I think it's a very, very valuable technique to, to use to, to convince yourself whether positioning is correct. Very simple. But it, of course, it, it requires film, and that may be another problem. 
uh, we cannot get film anymore. <laughs> uh, so who, who, who are using film and, and, and developing machines? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I like all this technique. I still like it. And I, I was very disappointed that, that we cannot buy any more of such films like the therapy verification film, which was an excellent film. It was produced by Kodak, but you cannot get it anymore. Presently, treatment simulation has a more expanded role in the treatment patients consisting of detonation of patient treatment position, target volumes, and organs at risk, and determination and verification of treatment field geometry. Generation of simulation risk for each treatment beam of currency with treatment uh, uh, to, to, to produce such graphs. And this is, again, our check film. And this is now a more modern uh, radiograph with a, uh, with a conventional uh, simulation machine, a simulator, using KV uh, radiation. Of course, we have a much better contrast and what's much better imaging uh, in KV uh, imaging compared with a mega voltage imaging. Modern simulators provide the ability to mimic some many treatment geometries, and this is one example. So we can here we have adjustable bars which can can mimic the, the field sizes. And uh, they can be, they, may, they are made of, of, of tungsten or something, so you can really see them on the film. And uh, that was a technique which has been used uh, in our institute still 20 years ago. Now, again, this is old fashioned, but I still think it's a very good technique, and, and uh, such conventional KV simulators are still in use in, in many hospitals. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So in the vast majority of sites, the disease is not visible on simulated radiographs. Therefore, we need, we need uh, uh, things like bony structures or lead wire clinically placed on the surface of a patient, or even surgically implanted fiducial markers. There is one system. It's called the Calypso system. Is someone using it? It's, it's a very uh, nice thing. It's, it's, a, it's a small probe which can be virtually put in, 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 into the tumor. And it, it's, it is sending a signal which can be detected. It can, the position can be detected and um, can be used for a, 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 very, a, a perfect fiducial uh, marker. But again, it's very expensive, and I know only a few centers, like in America, the, the big centers, who are using such a system. And still, it's not clear whether it's, it, it can overcome the problem of what I told you at the beginning. We don't see the tumor, we don't see the beam, and we have to match it. This is, again, an old technique, which is uh, still in use and, and quite nice. So this is a radiograph, and we, we can easily um, draw the uh, blocking. And it's used, of course, as a matter of record. But we can also use to determine the shielding directly here. And uh, we can, they, they are drawn by the doctor, and then, then they can be made uh, of this uh, information. Now we are using the modern CT simulators. This is a picture. It's a dedicated radiotherapy CT simulator, which are now generally available. And these are pictures made of that. And uh, it's well known that the position of each slice and therefore the target can be related to bone under 20 months through the use of scout or pilot images. What is interesting is that using such CT simulators, a virtual simulation can be done solely on CT information. And one of these that, uh, is that, that the dead CT data can be manipulated to render synthetic radiographs of the patient for arbitrary geometries. And such radiographs are called digitally reconstructed radiographs. It's well known, and uh, all, in many cases now they are used. 
They are produced mathematically by tracing ray lines from a virtual source position through the CT data of the patient to a, a, a virtual film plane and simulating saturation of X-rays. And the advantage is that anatomical information can be used directly for the determination of treatment field parameters. A transfer error, patient positioning a second time, and it can be avoided. This is an example of an DRR. And what is interesting is that the gray levels, the brightness and contrast, all the things now can be adjusted in such a way that it fits the needs to, to make good positions on that. That's, that's quite different from, from a a KV simulator. Another thing which has been also quite often used in our institute was the beam eye views, which are projections through the patient onto a virtual film plane, which is perpendicular to the beam direction. And uh, I will show here some of the beam eye views here, which are shown here. It's again the, the prostate. Uh, irradiation with a, a regular field, but from different directions, which can be, which are really applied. So we have not uh, 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 planar irradiation, but from from several sides in order to overcome the problem of a very irregular shape of the beam of the tumor. Uh, from each side, we can easily uh, see uh, construct such beam eyes views and also then compare with associated port films. So this is a, a comparison of conventional simulator. This is an advantage useful to perform a fluoroscopic simulation in order to verify isocenter position in field limits as well as to mark the patient for treatment. I have seen such techniques, of course, is a, is a little bit uh, Quite a dose to the patient. Uh, I think it's now the old fashioned and not done anymore. Disadvantages limited soft tissue contrast with conventional simulator. The tumor is not visible, requires knowledge of tumor position with respect to visible landmarks. So it requires knowledge of a well educated uh, radio oncologist. Restricted to setting film limits with respect to bone landmarks or in terms of with structures visible with the aid of contrast. So a CT simulator, CT simulator, it has an increased soft tissue contrast. It, it, uh, anatomical, axial anatomical information is available. Delineation of target and organs of this can be done directly on the CT slices. It allows uh, digital radio, uh, reconstructed radiographs or beam eye views. There's also some disadvantages, limitation use for some treatment setups where patient motion effects are involved and it requires additional training and qualification in 3D planning. So if, if I'm staying here and telling you things on this and this, it's fine. But the most important or much more important is the training which you should get somewhere. And um, I made one example with an exercise at Monday evening. I would like to do a much more exercise with that, but which cannot be organized. But maybe in the future, we can, we can simulate on a computer such equipment much easier. I, I know companies are now offering such as software which can simulate. So my dream is to do this really <laughs> in a computer lab. It would be good. So these are goals and tools in conventional and CT simulation. So treatment position in conventional um, uh, CT simulation, uh, many things can only rely to bony landmarks. In CT simulation, we have a better way to get out the information which is really needed. Now, last few words on magnetic imaging. Our imaging plays an increasingly more important role in treatment planning because, of course, MR is, is a soft tissue contrast, which is much more better. And even such small lesions can be seen with greater ease. The MRAE cannot direct use the steroid P simulation because the physical dimension of the MRE device, the equipment, and accessories may limit the use of immobilization devices and compromise treatment position. So it's, it's a rather narrow. 
hole that is not so easy to use. On the other hand, we have also other devices which are open devices. Bone signal is absent, and therefore digitally reconstructed radiographs cannot be generated. And there is no electron density information available for heterogeneity, heterogeneity correction of those calculations. Uh, we know that for uh, high energy photons, if you approximate approximate the, the, the model of the patient just with water, in many, many cases, it works quite well. If, if, if the lung is not involved, in, in many cases, it does also work. So what you can do, you can use the, 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 uh, the picture of the image from MR, and you can exchange the value of the pixels with that of, of water, and then do treatment planning. And uh, in, in many cases, this would, would really also work. What is still a maybe a problem that MR is prone to geomotical artifacts and distortion. Uh, these, especially if you do it for very precise radio therapy, it's, it's, it's a problem. There are methods to, to correct for distortions, but it's very time consuming. So I think yes, you cannot use this really for treatment planning for, the, say, for radio surgery. To overcome these problems, many modern visual simulation and treatment plans have the ability to combine the information from different imaging studies using image fusion or co-registration. So this is uh, one example. Here we have an MR image where the clinical target volume may be well seen by this wide area, and then we we segment this area, we can overtake this in the CT slide, where we do see nothing at all. And by doing that, uh, we can identify the target volume and can use now this for treatment planning, for dose calculation, and having the information of the CT. On the other hand, I know from studies who, um, who, where you can see tumor volumes or clinical target volumes in CT on a PET and an MR, and they may be quite different. Again, what is the truth? We don't know exactly. Oh, it's, so it seems to be a very simple thing, very plausible to do that like that, but it, again, it has some, some problems which we as a medical physicist, we cannot solve this problem. That it needs, again, a good education from the radio oncologist. So this is my summary. Patient dimension are always required for treatment time or monitor calculations, whether obtained with a caliper that's very old-fashioned or from the T slices. Those calculation, again, is a part only with a treatment planning system. Almost any image model can be used and is used for data acquisition for patient undergoing therapy. Even ultrasound can be used in some cases. The process of distinguishing relevant structures or volumes from background is called segmentation. Different methods are developed for that. The XYZ coordinate system of images, of different images, must be correlated to each other. This is called the registration, matching or image correlation. The display of different registered images data sets simultaneously called image fusion. Immobilization has two fundamental roles. I have already told that to immobilize the patient during treatment, to provide reliable means for reproducing the patient's positioning. There are many methods available. Treatment simulation is a major component in patient data acquisition. It started from with portal imaging, developed to de dedicated X-ray simulators, CT simulators, and recently cone beam imaging or MR imaging. It may be summarized by image-guided radiotherapy, and this is now the topic of the next talk by my colleague and friend, Pavel Kukulovic. So thank you for information.